Hello, and welcome back to Metaphysical Egypt. I'm Alan Peoples, joined again by Patricia Awian Lehman. Our website is horacerising.com. Hi, Patricia. Hey, Alan. Why don't you tell us what we're doing? Good to see you, too. So, yeah, we're going to get started today with a three, at least a three-part series um, on the alchemy of the Sphinx and the Cosmic Serpent. Um, and uh, the reason it's so long um, and there's so many parts to it, 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 it's the foundational knowing at the root of almost everything that we're going to look at um, in Egypt and in, in the symbolism, the metaphor, the, uh, uh, the mythology. Uh, it, it's all sort of connected to this understanding of what the, the, the Sphinx uh, and the feline energy is. Um, as even a basis for the matrix of time. So it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So we're going to get started today with the ma matrix of time and how we perceive time and go directly into our understanding of what happens when uh, heaven and earth separate to create the first breath of our perception of reality. So cool stuff. So we've talked a little bit about this, the fact that time is not linear, um, even though we seem to perceive it as such, because we perceive time as um, a measurement of movement. Uh, but this glyph that you see on the left is um, an ancient Egyptian glyph that means time. It's neha. It's time itself. And what you're looking at, time and eternity, right? Um, and what you're looking at is the path of the sun flanked by two spirals. It's basically two dual opposing wave spins that are the essence of duality in a physical uh, perception of time and space. So really fascinating because you see there's a glyph at the top. That jagged line is the glyph for water. It means N, right? It's N, the letter N as we know it. Um, but it's energy itself. It's that movement of energy that creates a perception of time as first breath, all related to the sun, the self. That symbol of the sun is the symbol of the self, the symbol of the universe, and the symbol, again, of the breath of life. So fascinating and incredible symbol to describe how we perceive uh, reality itself. Um, and then on the right, we see the, the uh, center of the Taurus field, this, um, the, the, you know, that foundational wave pattern, again, that we've discussed. And um, I put this image of the Dendera Zodiac on top to give you an idea of how time spins in and out from center as dual opposing waves spin um, as the basis for how we, you know, we can perceive reality in a physical perception of form um, and time and space. This is a wonderful image of Dante and Be Beatrice gazing upon the highest heavens um, from um, the illustrations, Gustave Doré's illustrations of the Divine Comedy. Um, and again, you're looking at that breath in and out of angles of, um, of light, angels, netters, netteru as expressions of the life force of how we perceive reality. We inhale in and out from center, again, in wave form. Um, and this is one of uh, Alan's favorite images. This is an image of the netter Hey, um, H-E-H, um, and he's sitting on um, the Neb symbol, or Noob, where we get Noob. the word Nubia, yes. Um, and uh, it means, yeah, gold or precious, the very precious. Uh, it can describe gems or jewelry, but it's, it's something that's very precious. And a lot of gold was found in Nubia, and Nubia was considered the precious place. So, again, um, remember these things because they are important, uh, and we'll discuss it later. But what I like to point out, too, is he's holding these two palm branches, which are used to measure time, um, the movement of time. And notice they're curved in, right? They're, they're, they're wave spin curving in. And on top of the serics there, are these uh, squares on either side that you see, the rectangles, you see images of Horus. He's wearing a double crown, which always means he's centered. He's come back to zero point. He's uh, 
able to wear the double crown of Upper and Lower Egypt because he's resolved his polarity, right? Mm -hmm. He's united the two lands and the two hemispheres of the brain, and he's riding serpents. So take a, you know, take a close look. This is fascinating, and those serpents are coming together to zero point in the center of this great breath of life as, you know, as that time, you know, dual opposing wave spin, either coming in, inhaling in, or exhaling out, involution, evolution. It's really so clearly explained by them. It's incredible. Isn't it? <laughs> we think we're just looking at, you know, drawings, and these drawings hold the secrets to, you know, how we perceive everything, how the breath of life, the foundational patterns of um, universal flow, nature's flow, um, from microcosmic, uh, you know, the, the very smallest uh, flow of life to the very largest, you know, to universal, uh, macrocosmic. Which um, absolutely energy. includes us as well. We're a part of that. We can't escape. Well, that. well, absolutely. Everything we discuss happens within and without. It's, it's, you know, sometimes we'll just talk about something happening outside us, but it's always happening within as well. And that's the secret to understanding mythology and symbolism. Uh, we're never just talking about the heavens because it, the heavens are just a map for what's happening within. Um, so we have, which seems mind boggling, but it really simplifies everything for us when we, right. when you, when you look out at the night sky and you see the stars, you're really seeing a reflection of <laughs> the inside yes. of your own mind. It's, that's and what's happening, and, and who's not? Who's to say you're not creating the pattern? We, we as mass consciousness aren't creating the patterns of the flow of the stars, the stars, the sun, and the moon. Um, maybe we are. Uh, but, you know, I think there's much larger patterns at play, the day and night cycles. And, the, uh, and, and when I say day and night, I'm not talking about just the day. I'm talking about, you know, the... You know, a day, a year, uh, a great year, and much, much larger cycles of time. There's a 12,000 year cycle we're going to talk about in an upcoming uh, presentation. It, it's just incredibly profound. And within that 12,000 year cycle, there's 6,000 year cycles and 3,000 year cycles, and, you know, <laughs> two and 15. You know, there's so many different cycles, and it's all the same breath. They all have the same formulas. It's fractal holographic patterning of life. The ancients got it. We're just beginning to start talk, talk, to talk about these concepts again. But once we understand them, we will have no more surprises because we will know. And, and I do believe people already do know what's happening next. This, this time on earth right now is one of the most significant, profound moments in our perception of time and space. Um, and we all can feel it. We all feel we're at the precipice of something. But when we get through some of these presentations and I show you what they, they actually knew here in ancient Egypt and all over the world, because we see the same understanding, maybe different iconography and symbols, um, but it's the same understanding of these patterns that express and, and tell us what's happening now. You know, the more so, we learn about this, the more I realize that ancient Egypt is not so much our past, but it's really our future. Exactly. This is huge. Well said. Um, absolutely. So, yeah, time only appears to be linear. It's actually spinning around us um, and dual opposing wave spins. And we're only experiencing one of those directions right now. But as in, in, in any breath of life, we must experience both. You know, we breathe out, that's one direction. We breathe in, that's another direction. And this happens in, in patterns within everything that exists in a living, breathing world. So keep that in the back of your mind as we continue. Um, so yeah, we measure time through the observance of eternally spiraling solar, solar and stellar cycles. Does it even exist? Is it relative, like Einstein said? Well, yeah, we found out as you move in space, time is absolutely relative. Well, it's just a matter um, of perspective. And based on magnetic charge, and this is huge, because our magnetism itself is changing on Earth. Right now, we, we know we've lost, at least we're, in the last 150 years, we've lost 
15, and now they're saying 20% of our magnetic field around the Earth. It's thin to this extent. That's one fifth, right? That's huge. How does that change perception? How does that change our observance of time? Is anyone else out there experiencing a speeding up of time? You know, uh, do we feel like we're not getting as much done as we used to get done? I know I am, uh, without a doubt. Um, and they say, you know, that there's many factors involved, but um, consciousness itself is changing. Well, wouldn't you say our magnetic field is intricately linked to the Earth's magnetic field and the Sun's magnetic field? And when those change, it causes a chain reaction all the way down to the lowest level, including us. Absolutely. In fact, um, if you've heard of the Schumann resonance, uh, this speaks a little bit to that, that the frequency of the Earth, the heartbeat of the Earth, is relative to what's happening with, you know, the sun. And, of course, the sun is relative to what's happening with the universe and the, all the other cycles of the stars around it. Um, and, you know, there, you know, we're going to get into all of these discussion, discussions at, in a great depth soon when we start talk, talking about these cycles of the, of the Earth and the sun, the 12,000 year cycles. But first, let's go on and, and start explaining more about how the ancients understood it so we can get into the, the really deep, profound, significant material. Right. Um, because it, it's really amazing. Um, so yeah, the Hindus called this reality Maya, um, which basically means it's an illusion. And again, that's a hard concept for us to swallow, but um, it's, it's, it's a word, it, well, it's a word used in Egypt for water today. If you it's want such water, an incredible word. It means so many yes. things in so many languages, which are all connected. And so many places in the world, we said India, you know, and, and, and of course there's the Mayan culture uh, in, in South America and Maya in Egypt is water, watery waveform, right? Flowing energy. Um, and again, it's that hologram created from the primordial waters each time we begin a new cycle. That first breath creates this, you know, this, this flooding of waveform or I'm Maya, I'm either the shadow or I'm what's real in the space in between, which we've already talked about. You know, are we the shadows dancing on the wall or are we what's real in the space in between? Mm. I am or I'm the illusion. We're both. We're both, of course we are, happening <laughs> all at once because there is no time. We're, we're perceiving, we're imagining the world into existence. And there's that beautiful watery waveform, right? Um, this is a, a Kurt Vonnegut uh, said this, and I found this meme and just fell in love with it. And you'll see it again in the presentation, but everything <laughs> is nothing with a twist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. It's the primordial waters, and then all hell breaks loose, right? We have sound and light, you know, thunder and lightning, and the next thing you know, we have this watery illusion of form. And it spirals. And it creates containers. It creates our sacred geometry and all the shapes, Plato's uh, solids. All of these things are created from this waveform. And of course, I'm going to get into that later. I, I'm never going to leave you hanging. It, it may seem like we're going too quickly, but it's all going to be explained. None of, you know, even the material as I present it is not linear. And therefore, I am challenged. I was challenged in trying to write a book because I need to bring in all of these concepts with everything that we talk about. So not to worry. We will go into more depth. Um, and, and you can also send questions, and we'll do our best to answer them um, in the messaging. So cycles of the sun, creation is separation. We've all seen um, how a cell divides into two, right? The cell division. Creation is separation, um, and that's why we call, you know, we've moved into a separation consciousness, and as we breathe out, we, fall, we, we become more and more disconnected from each other. But when we breathe back in again, that a reversal of direction, we, we involve back to center, and we begin to, to, to feel that unity um, and connectedness to all that is. And here we're looking at that breath as Chu and Tef Nut, um, that are basically separating heaven and earth. Um, and heaven here is uh, represented by Nut. And you see this figure with stars. 
uh, bent over, creating a container uh, with the earth. That's Geb on the bottom. And notice how his body is in a sine wave form. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that's earth, right? And so the heavens are considered fire. It's all these fiery stars, right? But what's in between is you're, you're seeing this figure of Shu with his arms up in the ka position. I'll have another image shortly, which is life force, right? He is atmosphere. What you don't see is Tefnut is there too, but she's the unseen force of nature as the watery waveform, right? So she is the spit of Nut, she's water, she is air, and we have our four elements. Um, and so this pyramid text uh, utterance is saying, ascend and descend, descend with Nephthys, or this is Nephthys or Nebhet, the sister of Isis. So she's in the bark that's descending. She's, uh, um, if you see the two barks are the boats um, on, on the legs and the arms of Nut, uh, you see one descending and one ascending. So ascend and descend with Nephthys, sink into the darkness with the night bark. Ascend and descend, ascend with Isis, rise in the day bark. And there you have it, these two different directional um, symbols to explain day and night. Um, Again, just subtle but incredible symbolism. Can you and can you go you, back one second? Of course. Why is Shu holding up Ankhs and why does he have the Ankhs around his arms? Because he's life force. <laughs> he's the wind. He's he's the solar wind. He's the the winds of the earth, the four winds of the earth. He he uh, he basically is representing atmosphere. And this atmosphere, this, this, you know, with Tefnu, remember, she's the unseen force, but together, this water and, and air, which is also, and I'm getting into this soon, um, uh, electricity and magnetism, you know, electromagnetism. This is the life force of our perception of reality. So, and that is the breath of life as what the Yank represents. And if you go back one more slide, to the one before right, that. We're not going the right direction here. <laughs> we have the sine wave, and this is really just what you're talking about. You know, you have Newt on the top, Geb on the bottom, and Shu in the middle. Every time the wave crosses a line, it creates Portal. a little area of matter. Yeah. 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 This is the crossing over. Um, it's really important. Um, I mean, dare I say, when Christ dies on the cross, it's a crossing over from one day cycle into a night cycle. And Cyrus does this. Um, he, he represents the underworld, which is the sine wave from the bottom. If you look at the blue line as the horizon, right? Horizon. Um, when we dip, when the sun dips below the horizon, the sun being a representation. And, and Hakim would always say that all the netters represented a different aspect of the sun. Again, fascinating. <laughs> yeah. So when that sun dips below the horizon, it becomes something else. And we only know it exists because it's reflected in the moon. And this is why we see Osiris often uh, related to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the phases of the moon, the mm -hmm. 14 phases of the moon. So, so much incredible symbolism. But once you understand it, you can understand symbolism all over the world because it's the same everywhere right and the understanding was, was the same but the cultural expression of it was slightly different but the basic right. knowledge was there and our mistake is in looking at these things and we see a green osiris or osiris with you know greens growing from his body and we say you know oh they're pagan gods and they were worshiping you know <laughs> you know the earth or the, the you know they it wasn't that they were worshiping they were explaining these patterns that are so significant to understanding the cycles um, and, and for letting us know what, in other words, if we know consciousness is, is devolving for one, what do we do? We build incredible you know, structures to enable us to harness energy to maintain a, a certain level of consciousness for a period of time, or we create 
a mythology and symbolism to tell our future selves what it is we're experiencing when we devolve to a point that we stop feeling it. When we stop, you know, feeling the currents and understanding how to navigate and harness them. So, you know, this is why this is why I'm so passionate about studying right. all of this. It, it has explained and, and answered so many of my questions since I was a small child. Um, why is why is the sky blue? You know, we've all asked the same questions, and this ancient knowing, this cosmology, this mythology, it tells us, it gives us our answers, and they are profound. You know, and that's what's exciting about all of this. And I'm presenting this to show everyone all of how this is all connected. This isn't just here's Hathor and here's what she represents, and here's Osiris, and here's Geb, and here's you know, Amun, and they, they don't represent these little individual box containers of, of, of symbolism and metaphor. They represent a huge story that is incredibly connected. And all of the rituals and everything that's presented, even from the very pre ancient pre-dynastic times into the post, you know, the, the more modern, you know, dynastic times, it's, it's all related to this great breath of life. You know, and the symbols and, and the language and everything had to change because this is what happens when consciousness changes. So it's all by, you know, it's all by design, you know, and, and we like to blame and, you know, the elite, you know, they started hiding this and they started telling us, well, that this is part of that evolution. You know, when we stop being able to understand, then we're not capable of handling the truth of how powerful we really are. So, you know, so many different things that come together to explain why we're where we're at right now. And this is the time of the great unveiling. Um, so let's get to it. Yeah. <laughs> so here I call this the birthing box and I'm going to talk a lot about the birthing box. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, some people call it, it, well, it is the birthing brick, it's the birthing box, it's something that the ancient women would stand on, they'd stand on two bricks, like birthing bricks. Well, I'm, I'm pre and presenting the concept because we were talking about Newt, because this image of Newt and Geb that we just saw, and the one on the papyrus that we're looking at now, that shows the cycles of the sun is also showing you that when earth and sky separate, they create the birthing box of all our unlimited potentials. And this is Hathor's hair, right? It's all related to Hathor. Again, we're going to talk a lot about Hathor as we move forward. But this uh, is the name of Hathor is a box, right? That's, that's Het. We say Hathor. But it's hit her. They didn't put the vowels, so you can we you can pronounce it Hathor or Hathor. We we got used to saying Hathor. Het hair. Hathor. Exactly, het hair. Um, this is this is really what we're looking at. The hair, the hor, is is what people say. Horus is the seed, right within the womb, the birthing box. That's what Hathor means. She gives birth to the seed of form. Right. Horus, of course, is the Greek version of hair. Yes. Well, we, we, I will use the term hair because, again, it's tone, sound, tone has often very similar meanings. You can say her, whore, har, he, you know, many different ways of saying it, but all very similar. When, I, when we say harvest, I'm saying, you know, you could say harvest, right? It's the harvest, the harvest, the ascended. Osiris, which is the seeding of the land, right? So mm -hmm. as he says his harvest, there's your harvest, harvest. So and all the other words associated with it, hour, horizon. Exactly. Uh, and these, yeah, these are all things we're going to talk about because we'll begin to look at our language a lot differently when we understand that all of our words, and this is in any language, stem from these basic sounds. It's, so it's incredible. So het hair is the place of the whore. So right. the place of Horus. And that is right. Hathor. Hathor. Yep. So and her the, the hair, her hair is actually this body of Nut. But I'm gonna I'll get into this later. Again, I'm introducing these concepts 
slowly, a little bit at a time, so you get used to seeing them. Um, I love this image on the right. It's, uh, it's Hathor as the cosmic cow, but you also see her seated on the throne, which was also, uh, they used this, this seat also as a birthing device. So there'd be a hole on the seat and you could give birth, right? Another birthing box. And of course, uh, the uh, cosmic cow is also Nut, right? The hair of Hathor. And then in front of the uh, the nose of the cow, you see an image of Hathor. And you can't, it's hard for you to see it, but she's she's turned up at the bottom. Her The bottom of her body is the serpent, right? Which is the line, uh, um, it's, it's related to the fertility of the earth. Again, the waveform, the sine wave. So again, profound symbolism, three different versions of Hathor in one sculpture or, or stone carving. So um, it's interesting, the, the place of the Horus or the place of Horus, the place of the sun is the same as the face of humanity. So yes. the expression on every one of our faces is really from the expression of the sun and we're just different, all different aspects of that same it's, yes, expression. It, that's what I say, we are all an aspect of the great one. You, some people call that God, Allah, uh, the, uh, the higher self, whatever you wanna call it, that the source, we are all individuated aspects of that primordial consciousness with a signature vibration exactly that's we, reflected that's on our faces exactly that's why every face would change half of his face was the face of every gnome and it changed so yes so again we're going to show you all these images as we go we, we like to get ahead of ourselves here's the face <laughs> of the <laughs> i like to just put this image up because it's 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 beautiful and it's 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 shaped like it's it's the shrine system but again um there's a birthing box here right mm -hmm. this was born into duality this temple this structure this four dimensional thing but these shrines um also are, are speaking to sound the breath you see the little uraeuses at the bottom there's mm -hmm. 11, the little snakes yeah there's 11 little uh cobras yes and then the big one, right? Right, one so, on top in the middle. Which is the, 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 the last part of the cycle and the beginning of the cycle, right? But that that is that serpent, you know, that, that emerges from the box as the first breath from the shrine, as the first sound. Hathor is all about sound. That's what a sistrum is. But what's really cool again is you see the two um, spirals, the currents. Mm -hmm. Dual opposing going inward at the top, right? The, that the end, and at the bottom, at her hair on either side, you see the two cobras coming up. One has the red crown and one has the white crown. Oh yeah, head. on either side, incredible. Right, and they're moving outward. Dual opposing waveform moving away from center, creating our perception of form, physical form, and then it comes back to center on top to bring us back, the end is always the beginning. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it reminds me also of the Nagas that we see in India and Cambodia. Yeah. The, the, the Hydra, essentially, multi-headed serpent. Yeah, we're gonna see them in the presentations as well. <laughs> very, very important symbolism. So yeah, this stuff is, is incredible. Um, so again, you know, life began when earth and sky separated, earth, air, fire, and water. And it's, you know, it's this life force position, ka. You know, we all, you know, this ka is, we all have ka, and it is the life force. And here from the pyramid texts, the secret image of Shu who separates heaven from earth from the complete darkness. You know, we move from, from darkness to light. So... You know, I'm not just spitting this stuff out because I, I, I think it means that. I'm getting this. <laughs> I've read the text. I've read, <laughs> I've, I've read a lot of, a, a huge amount of research in the past, uh, well, all of my life, but really focused research in the past uh, 13, 14 years that I've been here in Egypt. And uh, yeah, it's mind blowing. So here's a wonderful image of Shu, and it's, it's a headrest. 
right? Um, and we see these headrests, you know, in the museums everywhere. But this one is so special because it's Shu, and he's holding up this headrest, right? Uh, he, he's between a pair of lions, all right? And, and we're going to call these lions. You could call them the ochre, right? They, they also call it Rudy. And um, they, the two of them can represent yesterday or tomorrow or Shu, or Te, and, Shu and Tethnut. They're also represented as the two lions, right? As this breath of waveform moving from center, right? Um, and they're holding up the head of the sleeper or the deceased as he holds up, in the same way that he holds up Nut. So the body, of course, you know, whether it's just sleeping, if it's on a bed, right? Or it's on its deathbed uh, or dead, um, the neck goes in that. Uh, curve thing that he's holding up doesn't look very comfortable for sleeping I might add um, but at any rate ha um, Hakim always called this the spine tickler which I find fascinating <laughs> so maybe it was used for healing but what I find fascinating of course this is this is that great breath moving out um, and the twin I say the twins are separated at birth because Shu and Tefnu represent Gemini right mm -hmm. the Gemini twins this is so important. Do we see they, they represent Gemini on the ceiling of Dendera? Exactly. And, and again, I'm going to have that very soon for you. Um, and what's again interesting is this duality because the neck, if, if the neck is the place where everything switches for us as far as our right brain, left brain control. Um, our, it is our left brain that controls the right side of our body and the, the uh, left brain contain, controls the right side of our body, and everything happens at that center at the neck, which many say separates your your own heaven from earth. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if we talk about Kundalini energy and chakras, and 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 which we are going to talk about, I promise you. Um, so I put underneath that image another image of the Sima Tawi, because again. The Sima Tawi is all about that top of the T being the, the voice box, right? The throat, the same area. This is the place of resonance. Which you right? said was ruled by Taurus. Exactly. T, Tau, Sima Tawi. This is so important. So that duality comes into resonance at our neck, right? Mm. Our voice box, sound. So back to that half tour, the sound coming back together and then breathing out, in and out, you know, evolving, devolving. Uh, we breathe out into separation consciousness and in back to unity consciousness, our zero point, our heaven, when we can wear the double crown of upper and lower Egypt or the two sides of our brain. Mm. Uh, and I know this is deep stuff. And again, I promise you, we are going to talk about it um, Again, many again. times, mm -hmm. many times. So yeah, and on the upper left-hand corner, we see this great image of Capre, and he has Horus where behind his neck. Um, this is an important place. Our vocal cords, our sound, um, our ability to create resonant sound or dissonant sound. But back to Shu and Tefnu. <laughs> So here's the image you were talking about, Alan, of uh, Shu. He's wearing the feather and Tefnut. She's the lioness uh, with the solar disc on her head. And uh, notice that their hands are forming the bottom of the sine wave, right? Yes. <laughs> Which is, and they're not quite touching. Again, important. So they represent currency. Um, and he, he is L, electricity, right? And we know the early gods, L and Ba L, all mm -hmm. important, all related. Ma, you know, mama, magnetism, the feminine. What is the, you know, the magnetic current can be nurturing or it can be whew, <laughs> nasty. Um, <laughs> it can burn us, right? So that, that dual, you know, that feline energy. Um, and, um, you know, together they form electromagnetism, this currency. Um, and I show these images to the left because this is Tefnut. We see her all over the world. Um, and we see her on the ancient temples. 
uh, here in Egypt, she's at the top and she always has a spout between her paws for water to come out. Um, and this is often used for water that's used on the ceilings for ritualistic purposes, for purification of some of like the statues and the golden images. And then that water would go through what we call a, a, a false door. Um, and it would go through the bottom in between her paws and come out and fall to the to basins that were on the ground on the outside of the temple. So you're basically on the ceiling considered the heaven portion, the sky, the heavens of the temple, coming down as sacred water from the heavens. So it becomes the, you know, this holy water that uh, can be used for multiple purposes. Um, and again, it's a ritual that is actually holding within it this important knowing that this water from Nut, the heavens, you know, we see them holding the new jars. This is sacred water from the heavens. It's powerful. And that water is, is this stellar and solar waveform, the plasma, the, the energy, the light, liquid light coming from the heavens. So, yeah. <laughs> and we see these lions everywhere, all over yep. the world. And they mean the same thing. In Always China, that. in India, yep. in Persia, everywhere. in Europe, yep. where they didn't even have lions <laughs> yep. after, after 10,000 years that, ago. The one way up in the upper left-hand corner is from Glastonbury. And the water coming out is iron rich. And what is, you know, iron, that the symbol for iron is F-E. F -E. And it's the iron water that, you know, that comes through the tour, Glastonbury tour, and out at this wonderful fountain, which I love to fill with, <laughs> fill my water bottle so I can drink, because it's powerful. It's life force energy. The Sea line, iron line. <laughs> exactly. They call it the red, uh, the red water or the red, uh, 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 they have the white water and they have the red water. The white water that they can use for drinking because it doesn't have the iron. The iron water, you don't you don't drink constantly because you can get too much iron in your system. But we all need iron because it is, you know, it's it's life force energy for our bodies. It's coming through the tour, so it's purified. That's what pure that's what our purification systems actually do. Those who build the natural ones are using stone. Um, uh, and, uh, well, if it were coming down a stream, yeah, <laughs> but this is coming out of the earth, really. Um, so it's really primordial it is, water, untouched. It is. It's moving water. So primordial water is something different, which we are going to talk about because there's some primordial water here that's in a very powerful spot. Oh, right. Like we were talking about the great Libyan aquifer and all the other uh, aquifers that are. Yeah. So we are going to get to that because these. These energies that are not moving, and uh, Marie, Maria Wheatley talks a lot about the, the difference between the waters, um, the subterranean waters, but the, the primordial water, the water that doesn't move, it's, it's in one place contained. Um, that water is incredibly powerful. So, yeah, lots of cool things we're going to get to. Wow. All right. So where do we get the uh, phrase, the spitting image of his mother, our father? <laughs> well, it's the spit of Nut, right? Uh, tef Nut, Tef means the spit of Nut, right? Tef Nut. Um, so this is this is what we're talking about, you know. It's and, and this spittle from the, you know, the, it's basically coming from the Netaru. It can, it's considered to have regenerative properties. Um, and they use this for healing and blessings, as I said. And it sounds very crass when we say spit, but what you're really talking about is the moisture. Right, right, exactly. And when we say spit, Hakeem did this so well because he would be spit, right? <laughs> but it, that, that, if you imagine how somebody spits, it's like, right? It's that energetic form. It's not. Oh, it's like moisture word. plus energy. <laughs> exactly, exactly, electromagnetic force feel it's it's life force itself so yeah um and of course the, you know with the story of tefnut um which i'm going to get to in a minute is is all about the um this this movement she is the moisture the water the life force of the land and all over the world when that life force leaves you know when we dry up 
you know, when we have droughts, when we have our seasonal uh, dry periods, you know, this is when the life force leaves the land. And then we celebrate with great festivals when the life force returns. Mm -hmm. This is the story of Tefnut, um, which I'm going to talk about. But there's something else about Tefnut um, <laughs> that I find absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to tell you a story because Hakim said that the Sphinx was Tefnut, right? He, he taught this since the, the day I met him. Um, and uh, he swore by it, and he never explained why. So one of the things I, in, in my research that I wanted to truly understand is why the Sphinx was Tefnut. You know, I, I do trust what Hakim said, and I felt that the Sphinx was a female entity. I could feel the great mother within her, um, and, and so many people do, but I didn't know why she was you know, this, this great netter called Tefnut. And so, you know, I was studying it and getting closer and closer and understanding the floods and, and you know, the cycles of the flood. But, you know, I, I knew it was much deeper than that. And one day while I was researching online, I saw a meme and it basically, the meme said, never sleep where a cat sleeps, right? And what's funny is I grew up, you know, you know on this huge, like, farm out, in the, out way out in the country and I had cats you know I had so many cats and they all you know all the, the all, every, all the cats in the house wanted to sleep in my bed so I had all the cats on my bed all the dogs under the bed but um you know all my life my cats have wanted to be all over me you know <laughs> and I thought well gee that's not good what does that mean so I looked it up online and um uh, I found all these medical websites that spoke this this absolute truth because I thought maybe it was a joke, but it was an absolute truth. And when I when I read what they had to say, they described um, they basically described the the, the the Giza plateau. It was because cats like to sleep in areas where there's geopathic stress. And they went on to describe places where there's underground running water and caverns and, you know, you know, it just everything that describes, you know, what the Giza Plateau was um, and still is today. Um, so geopathic stress is natural radiation of kinetic energy that rises up through the earth, which can cause magnetic anomalies created by subterranean running water certain mineral concentrations, fault lines, and underground cavities. Hmm. That doesn't explain the Giza Plateau, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I basically, you know, and, and it's not only cats, ants, and termites, I've even heard vultures, all attracted to this, you know, geopathic energy, right? Um, even the, uh, they talk about, like, Lake uh, Loch Ness in Scotland and how it's a, uh, it's a huge fault line underneath and a huge place of geopathic stress. Mm. And many people think that this whole idea of Nessie is about this, this geopathic, this, you know, electromagnetic energy. Um, right. When you see a little outburst of energy, you'll, you'll see a wave pattern go through the water. Exactly. Exactly. So there's your Nessie. Um, and, you know, I've read about other lakes that have their own stories of their mm -hmm. own Nessie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All, <laughs> all over the world. It's again, it's everywhere. These sea monsters um, that nobody ever sees. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so it, it begins to explain so much. Um, and it's really, you know, these places, it, it's speaking to the fertility of the waters, the energy, the magnetic currents. You know, we've talked a little bit about these currents and how incredibly powerful they are, but important. And, you know, that they built their structures, their temples at these places where two paths of water crossed, right? Mm -hmm. This is this this is important. So what are we looking at with the Giza Plateau? Here here are here's your underground aquifers. Um, and this is what the Giza Plateau was. It, it, you know, it, they, they actually have the man-made tunnels for running water, but there were the natural aquifers as well of running water under the plateau. And someone created this meme, um, and I absolutely love it because you can see the picture. <laughs> in, the, in the cartoon image on the left, you see Hakim and Ansari Hawass as two dual posed <laughs> views of what it might be. <laughs> yeah, you can see the Tesla Tower. And I'm going to do a whole presentation on the pyramids, but, um, and how, you know, 
they're they're you know they're built as these huge ancient structures to harness the energy of the earth right these powerful currents um and uh you know it's so much more so again, Shu and Tefnut as electromagnetic waveform. Well, here's a picture of, of electromagnetic waveform. Um, and you can see how the electric aspect is, is vertical, like Shu, right? And mm -hmm. the magnetic aspect is horizontal, like Tefnut, right? Shu, the wind and the solar wind, right? It's the Ka, you know, holding up the, the heavens. But Tefnut are the earth currents affected by solar, lunar, stellar currents, right? Because that's what the earth currents, how they're created. There's an interaction between these, these, all these currents coming from the heavens with, you know, what's happening in the core of the earth and, and the, the, the different wave spin, the dual opposing wave spin of the earth. And it all comes together to create this, this grid pattern, this matrix, right? Matrix of time and space. Uh, that, uh, you know, the ancients understood how to harness with their structures all over the world. That's fantastic, that little image of Shu with a sail. Well, you see the I, I wind in the sail. <laughs> it gets better. Um, and this is, uh, on the bottom, this is uh, Akhenaten as the Sphinx. Mm. And he's holding the new jar upside down. Right? Oh, right. So it's coming, that what precious weight, life force from heaven coming into the earth right isn't that gorgeous uh life-giving breath so here here's your image again so i was trying to get through look at the mast alan it's an it's object an itself <laughs> i knew you would love that um again life force really important breath of life key of life so important Conduit between heaven and earth, a channel for conveying energy. This image in the upper right-hand corner, isn't that absolutely gorgeous? That was huge, by the way. It was in a corner of the Egyptian museum. It's no longer there. Uh, but it was near where they had the beard of the Sphinx and the Uraeus of the Sphinx, all unmarked in this corner. Um, and uh, look at that, gorgeous. And this was once at the top of the temple, and it's quite large. Just like the center image. Um, Do and you know you which can, temple? No, I don't. I, it, I'm totally unmarked, but it had to have been a large temple. Um, and of course, that water would have been coming out between the paws. And you can see the paws are no longer there, damaged or, or broken off. But look at how oh, powerful yeah. that, that, that image is. So, yeah, you can see why I'm so attracted to this. But again, it just keeps getting better. So. <laughs> This image is from the ceiling of Dendera, and it's a sphinx um, with a serpent on its head. And uh, it is named the Ka of Ra. All right, the Ka, the life force of the sun. As the Wait, sphinx. you know, interestingly, there's a hole on the top of the head of the sphinx, which some people say is an opening to the inside of it, but- It's maybe not, it was, it's maybe, not. It, maybe it was, uh, a hole for a pole that held a decoration like this serpent. It very well, and, and I can actually envision that. Um, and yeah, that that's an interesting observation. Uh, but yeah, Hakim had actually been there and seen within it. It's very very shallow because um, I remember asking him about it because everybody has that old image and they think, oh, what's that? <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, a shallow opening. There, there's other openings there, but um, not not on her head. But uh, yeah, it, this Ka of Ra translates into the shining of Ra as the vital force emanating from Ra. Now keep in mind, those pyramids are solar pyramids, um, all based, the symbolism, the metaphor is all based around the sun. Um, and then the serpent on, on the head is really important. Um, it's the serpent energy has always been representative of fertility, right? I mentioned this which is related also to Eve. We know about the serpent who, um, who seduces Eve. Um, Asherah, Mary, Hathor, it's related to, again, this feminine energy. Um, and, um, you know, Tefnut was considered to be both the left 
the moon and the bright eyes of Ra, right? Uh, representing both heavenly sources of light, both the sun and, uh, and dryness and the moon and moisture. And these, remember, I've, I've spoken about this before, the two aspects of Hathor. Now, I had mentioned it as Hathor and, and Sekhmet, but this also relates to Hathor and, and Tefnut. Tefnut and Sekhmet have similar understandings. Um, and again, I'm going to get to the story, but... Um, uh, the story of Tefnut as, you know, this, well, I, I can I can tell the story now because it is fascinating. You know, sure. we talk about her being moisture, right, and, and water. And the, the plateau is, you know, it is, there's so much water there. And there was water running through all these tunnels. And, and sometimes there were shafts or openings to the tunnels. And so the sun would shine through at different parts of the day and heat the water. And then you have cold water running through. And together, these, these, these two waters or, you know, hot and cold water create this, you know, ionic atmosphere, this supercharged atmosphere. So again, you know, you're creating this atmosphere for what? Well, if you understand how negative ions work, it affects consciousness and, and can raise consciousness. So, you know, we're going to have a huge discussion about this. And I'm sorry I keep saying this, but, you know, I, I just want to introduce these concepts so they're fully understood before we really go deep. Right. We're um, still in the introductory phase. But yes. Uh, but this water <laughs> is so important as the life force of everything, um, and uh, it, it's it's feline energy. And uh, so anyway, the, the story goes that Tefnut gets so upset uh, when Egypt falls out of Maat balance. You know, kind of like we're at today. Uh, <laughs> so she gets angry and she hightails it out of Egypt and heads south. Uh, for Nubia, remember Nubia, the gold, the precious? So she goes south and she takes the life force, the energy, the water with her. So this is the dry season in one respect on their annual cycle, um, but it also speaks to a much larger 12,000 year cycle. Really, really important stuff. I, you know, I just wish that we could say it all in one short lecture, but we can't. <laughs> So again, we're going to get, to, you know, we, we're going to get to all of this. But the the good news is, Ra gets upset that she's gone and taken the life force with her. So he sends her brother Shu and Toth to cajole her into coming back to Egypt again. And so they they go on their mission and they convince her to come back. And they she returns with dancing. Um, Nubians and, and musicians and everyone's having, you know, it's a big festival of drunkenness, right? And we're going to talk about this soon. But so this is the story, this ebb and flow of moisture uh, that also speaks to currency. So keep that in mind. Oh, and guess what, folks? Kafre translates into the Ka of Ra. This is important. <laughs> so think about that. Ka F Ra, the Ka of Ra, the life force of the sun. He's responsible, or said to be responsible for the middle pyramid, mm -hmm. right? And that breath of life, you know, coming, right? Think about it. This alignment with Tefnut, mm -hmm. the spirit of Nut. <laughs> So what could that possibly be? So this is an alignment with a fee line, an iron line, right? And again, I'm going to get into a lot, lot more about this, but we found liquid deposits that have solidified of iron right up and down the area between the middle pyramid and the sphinx. This iron, this molten like iron, it seems to me just from a not a you know not not an expert uh, geologist, but what what I and I found when I started when I moved here to Egypt, I used to hike all the time on the plateau. So I would find you know all this this it was like red stuff, and it and it, it was dry. And I I used to I would take some of it and don't tell anybody, and I put it on my altar and I left left at the foot of the pyramids, right? So I put it on my altar, 
and uh, with all the other rocks and stones that I would find that I found, you know, called to me, I should say. And anyway, I, you know, I came out maybe a couple weeks later and uh, was, you know, cleaning them off or something. And I noticed that this red stuff had literally melted, mm. literally melted. And what's funny is when, you know, Susan Moore, our geologist, came, you know, and I showed her this stuff on the plateau, she obviously was incredibly excited. I also showed this to Robert Schock, um, and they have differing opinions on what it could be. Uh, but this this red... <laughs> what did they each say? Well, she took a chunk back with her, and the same thing happened to her. It disintegrated. Um, now, I've been told that because it's out of its element uh, and it's so old, it, it, that that's what happens. Um, what do you uh, mean so it disintegrated? What did it turn into? Dust. Nothing. For her, it was dust. For me, it, so it was. A, it was a solid piece, and then it just turned yes. into. It was, yeah. Okay. It, 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 it was kind of bizarre. Now, Susan, Susan found some inside the middle pyramid. Um, and of course, and, and we actually want to interview Susan for one of our segments and talk about this because this iron line um, is incredibly important. And so uh, anyway, she says it, she, she has different ideas. Maybe they were doing something uh, technologically with iron inside the middle pyramid and it, uh, you know, it liquefied and, and came out through the middle pyramid and seeped up into the ground. Uh, there's just so many different things that it could be, but um, there's deposits, I think even maybe in the Osiris shaft, she, she might have found some, and then uh, you can see it, and you know, when we do the tours, I take people to show them this, because it, it falls into line with everything that we're talking about, um, and, and um, the speed line, in my opinion, is this ancient line of fertility um, that the Sphinx was in alignment with um and you know if we you know i had it i think on one of the images where the sphinx itself the front falls of the sphinx is the letter l right for where we get lion lion, <laughs> lion right two different spellings um but um and again there's <laughs> just so many things we can point out but this ancient line you know when i was you know, studying this cat, you never sleep or cat sleep, it dawned on me that there might have been a very, very powerful line that ran through the Sphinx. And, you know, I've had many people speak to me about how uh, the breath of life begins in, you know, the heartbeat of the earth begins on the Giza Plateau, you know, as this, this the, that first sound that is the breath of life. So what, what I described is that first breath is the, is the current, coming from the source, you know, it, it, it can be described as coming from the Giza Plateau, right? But this line goes all the way around the earth as in my, what I was thinking as an ancient magnetic equator. But the funny thing is, I had only been taught in school that there was a geographic equator, right? They don't teach that, you know, have you ever heard before you, before you knew me, Alan, that there was a magnetic equator? Nope. Nobody, everyone I talk to about this, and I, I, I give lectures everywhere, no one has ever heard about a magnetic equator because they don't teach this stuff. No, we have the equator, we have the Tropic of Cancer, and the Tropic of Capricorn. Exactly. That's and all the I prime meridian. Exactly. So, you know, of course, yes, my first thought was, you know, pyramidian, prime meridian, you know, I was having all these thoughts. But my thought was, well, the prime meridian goes north to south. She is in alignment with the prime meridian, right? And pyramidian is said to mean fire in the middle. All right, fire in the middle. That, that you know, okay. And so my mind was it was going crazy, and I thought, well, what if there's a horizontal um, magnetic line? You know, it was like it seemed to make sense. So you know, I I use Google. I admit it. I I just typed in Google magnetic equator, and what came up was mind-blowing for me because this image came up and it's an image of an ancient powerful curtain um, uh, current that uh, someone you know and, and not just one person but several people have been speaking about I found YouTube videos 
Um, and it's basically what they called an ancient magnetic equator that ran all the way around the Earth, connecting many ancient powerful sites, including Easter Island, the Nazca, the, the Nazca drawings or lines, Angkor Wat in Cambodia, Mohenjo-Daro, Pakistan, Petra here in Egypt, see it? No, no, Petra in Jordan, Sila in Egypt, and the Sphinx and the Giza pyramids, all aligned on this incredible great circle around the earth. But what Susan and I have done is started to go to many of these places to see if there are similar patterns. One of those places was Angkor Wat, um, and Alan was there in Cambodia with me. You were there, we were there for about a week before my tour group came. Right. I think. And, um, you know, what we found was they were using this iron rich uh, conglomerate of stone um, as an insulator in a lot of their structures, which we found fascinating um, as one of the elements. And remember how we all got exhausted at the end of every day? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Susan and I thought, well, maybe that's because we're, we've been surrounded by so much iron. <laughs> um, it seemed to just suck the life out of us. But, All we wanted uh, to do was sleep. Yeah, I remember, you know, it was, it was wild. And it, the same happened with the tour group, you know, and, and there were a lot of young young people, you know, not that I'm old, but, you know, a lot of people that would want to go out. And we, we all had great ideas about going out at night and doing things. And, you know, it, it, we all just dragged ourselves out for a little bit. And it's like, eh, going back. It's so powerful there. And what they built was so precise. It still works. You can feel portals of energy everywhere. And it's interesting, we noticed that uh, we didn't have instruments to measure this, but where we thought the most powerful energy was coming up from the ground were areas that they had blocked with big stones, like yeah. a plug to dampen it. Yeah. So even yeah. though it seems like they're cementing over and trying to tamper down the energy of the place, it, it still functions. Yeah. And, and I, just some of the, we found portals. We found so many portals. We found, well, the pyramid, um, that pyramid was incredible. And the stories about, you know, the running, underground running water, tunnels of running water. And our guide, uh, who you didn't meet, but he was a fabulous guide. Uh, I had so many questions for him because, you know, I had visions of them using gold inside some of the chambers. And he said, yeah, they were lined in gold. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he said that to test the underground wandering water that they had uh, put stuff like under the water in one area and they would find it coming up in other areas, other sites, so that the sites were connected by these underground tunnels of running water, very similar to here. Um, and we haven't even talked about that here. So, uh, yeah. Let's see, what's the purpose of covering everything in gold other than to make it look pretty? There's an energetic purpose. And that, that's a whole presentation to talk about why gold and why all the gold in Tutankhamun's tomb. And uh, there's, uh, yeah, but we'll, yeah, let's, let's stay here. <laughs> and we'll okay. talk about that later. Because, yeah, all this uh, stuff. Tangents are so tempting. Aren't they? Yes. <laughs> Again, my problem with writing a book. So, and, and Saxi Woman is also on this line, another hugely powerful site in Peru. So what my feeling was immediately is that they built all of these places to harness, you know, these structures at these places to harness this, the powerful. And, and if you consider this ancient magnetic uh, um, line of fertility, it's the place where the dual opposing currency meets, right? So it's that line. So you're basically, that line is zero point. If you can harness that energy and resolve it through resonance, you've got the most powerful energy on the planet. Hence the pyramid, right? This is so important. You know, so, I just noticed that this line looks like it goes through Dogon country as well in Mali. Yeah, it, it, it hits some, it's pretty close to Kalash, I think, Kalash temple in India. Um, and and I, actually, yeah, I found this pattern when I went to India and I talked to you guys about it. We went to the five elements temples, remember? And uh, uh, Elizabeth and I had discussed it at great length. She had studied there for 40 years with her master. And uh, through our discussion that, you know, we found that there was this, that, that they speak to metaphorically and symbolically this ancient powerful line that divided um, India with 
this lower part of India and then the upper part of India. And so again, um, you know, and in Egypt, and again, I'm going to do a whole presentation. on That's this. so interesting. You're right, because even linguistically, India is divided into you have the Dravidian languages in the south yeah. and yeah. the uh, Indo-European languages in the north. Well, it's, it's upper and lower Egypt all over the world. Uh, you're right. <laughs> and this line also divides upper and lower Egypt. This this line goes through Saqqara, Giza, right? So this powerful place is where they divided upper and lower mm. Egypt. And when I say Kemet was the, was the physical reality, that's what I'm referring to. Upper and lower Egypt is the dual opposing currency that we harness in our brain. And that, you know, the two sides of our brain are divided by a magnetic equator, mm -hmm. right? This is, this is whatever I speak about here is happening within us. Um, and this is what we want to harness, right? Um, and they're showing us how to do that. It's resolving, it's transmuting polarity. Um, and I'm going to show you how they did this on so many different ways, how they show it different ways, metaphorically, about everywhere throughout Egypt. This is the key. And this is what's, this is what this moment in time is, is talking about that, that eventually we are going to reverse direction and no, we don't get here right away, but we will get close. And this line, by the way, I believe is also speaking to the ancient, the place where the sun would hit the earth on its journey, uh, the path of the sun on the ecliptic around the earth. So can you imagine, you know, that, that this incredible mind, this incredible, powerful mind. This is what the equator would be if the earth was not tilted. This is the equator from a time when the earth was yes. not at a 23 degree angle. Exactly. And so uh, my, my, the next few presentations are going to talk about this raising of the jet, the lowering of the jet as a cyclical event, as mm -hmm. a great, you know, world age event that happens regularly, tick tock. Right. So, so essentially we alternate between the equator we know now and this equator. Yes. Yep. So you said where it is now. Well, here is where the magnetic equator is now, because of course I had to look that up. And you can see it's much lower than the line I just showed you. And it's not one nice, beautiful line, but it's basically constantly moving and all over the place. Because what has happened? We have fallen out of Mahat. We're out of balance. So now it's just this big, you know, huge, but it's there. And it's, it, it, it's, it does wreak havoc. There's the, the North, you know, the South, North, whatever, the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, there's different magnetic anomalies all over the planet. Um, the one in Alaska, the one, you know, there's the, in Bermuda, China. There's all these things happening because we're out of Mahat. Um, and uh, I, mean, I don't want to get into the physics of it now, but, well, I just want to point out when I was talking about Tefnut going south, right? You know, to Nubia, well, this line has moved down and it goes, it starts around Ethiopia, right? Which was Nubia, right? That, that it was south of Aswan. And um, this is where she goes on that greater cycle, right? Or maybe she goes because everything's separate. So again, we're going to talk about this because this is, there are, there are two currents. They split into two, Gemini. Shu and Tefnu, one goes north and one goes south. This is the one we can see. And then there's the other one, which is the lushness. And where is the lushness? You know, it's up in Scotland, right? Scotland, England, where is the lushness in the world? Um, so again, stuff we're gonna discuss in great detail um, with, you know, just so much information to talk about what this all means. And it has to do with um, <laughs> the Ark of the Covenant and so much more. Um, so I'm going to present this, this particular slide again, but it's really important for understanding what happens in this moment, that first breath. So here, um, and, and this is so powerful, is the Dendera Zodiac. And in the center of that zodiac, that's on the left, on the, you know, the upper left, you see this image of Ipe or um, Tarot, and she is at the center, right? She's the center of the galaxy. Some say she, 
she is the Big Dipper, but here the Big Dipper is the mayor, um, and she has Draco on her back, so she's always right in the circumpolar stars, not the center, excuse me, not the center of the galaxy, but closer to the um, ecliptic pole or the center of the circumpolar stars. And out of her belly, we consider her almost like the big, the, the pregnant grandmother, uh, <laughs> if that makes sense, uh, but the great mother. And Anubis is the path opener, and he is riding a tool called the mare. It's a hieroglyph. So it, this mare is shaped like an A, and I call him the alpha dog. It's a plow. It is a plow. And what do we call the Big Dipper? But a plow, right? Well, some cultures call it a plow. But this plow in Egypt is a real tool that they use for seeding the earth, placing seeds in the earth. Right, and for cutting water, a channel. Cutting a channel for water to flow, the currency, right? Cre creating a pathway. Exactly. And Anubis was known as the embalmer. So what is he doing here but embalming us in this path of currency, the stars, the zodiac, right? All of these stars that encircle the earth, you know, as the sun goes through them, it's creating this path of currency that basically embalms us or veils us, right, in this perception that we are form. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, powerful symbolism and of course this a like i said i call him the alpha dog right <laughs> because he's creating the alphabet the tones, the tones right as he breathes out and they come out in this spiral right the spiral great breath of life um as the tones we use to and it's no coincidence that a is the first letter of our alphabet Right. It's Which is interesting because Omega is Hathor and that's the end. So <laughs> of the well, that's you see my Alpha and Omega here. That is the whore within the box. The Alpha and the Omega is Hathor. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right. And it so, itself is also an Ankh, as Jocelyn yes. pointed out. You have the Omega on top of the Alpha. Exactly. Ugh, unbelievable. Breath of life. See how powerful, see how amazing this is? That's the Alpha and Omega. The Nut, the hair of Hathor with the seed. Yeah, all as life force. This powerful breath of life that stems from the ecliptic pole. And again, we're going to talk about this a lot, but this is powerful. Um, and so I said it was the pile, the Big Dipper. And what did the Big Dipper and the Little Dipper form? But the swastika which what is speaking symbolically about the spin, right? Dual opposing spin. We actually see, you know, the swastika that we're used to seeing is the clockwise or what we call positive spin, but we also have counterclockwise swastikas as symbols throughout the world as dual opposing spins. And what could that possibly intimate, but that possibly the earth at one time spins the other direction. But I'm just going to leave you hanging with that one because we're going to bring this up later. Well, we um, should point out also that um, until the swastika was co-opted by the Germans in the 1930s, for thousands of years of human history, this has been one of the most positive symbols. Lucky. It's a lucky symbol. It's life. On the it's face the of the earth. Of life as, the, as the spin. It's what we're talking about. The spin is everything. They have pole dances. What do you think pole dances are? Showing the spin. <laughs> because we exist. <laughs> you, mean, you mean a maypole. <laughs> <laughs> no, they do pole dances. It, well, in, in South America. <laughs> real pole dances. Yes, we do the maypole dance too, which is also a takeoff from the spin. <laughs> and sometimes we do it and some people take the ribbons and go one direction and some go the other direction. Yeah, exactly. Right? So it's still weaving the fabric of reality. Yeah. <laughs> People laugh at me, but you know, and, and they mock me when I say dual opposing weight spin. But trust me, folks, it's important. Yeah. Uh, so directional it's the fractal spin, pattern of everything. It is. Directional spin determines whether one side of a magnet will attract another. Opposite vortex spin attract, like spins repel. 
What we perceive as north and south poles are actually clockwise and counterclockwise vortex spins. We talked about this already, admitted by like a magnet. So you know how the water spins one direction down the toilet and it, uh, on the south pole and it does on the north pole. Um, and they create force fields. And we are all about life force fields. And they, these life, these, these force fields affect conscious perception. This is huge. If we learn how to harness this energy, we can raise consciousness of itself. Interesting if you consider that a lot of people are saying our consciousness is actually outside of our brain. Our brain is the interpreter of it's the signals the, it, that are contained in our own personal magnetic fields, which the vortex of which is the top of our head, you know, coming from the bottom to the top. <laughs> Exactly. And that and yes, it's it's in the Taurus field. It's not it's not in the brain. It's it's outside us. And right, the brain and, is just a sensory organ to decode exactly the information that we're we're carrying in our energetic signature all the time. And consider this: mass consciousness is in the Earth's magnetic field, which is weakening. Think about it. Wow. And just like those pendulums you showed us, that you 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 start them all different times, and suddenly they they synchronize and they line up. Yeah. What if that's what if that's like all of our consciousness? You know, we're all ticking at different speeds, but at some point, it's going to synchronize. Yeah. The, we're going yeah. we're going to go back into maat. It's all going to synchronize, and is that yeah. unity consciousness? What I've been talking about. <laughs> It's exactly what I've been talking about. And it can't be any other way. Mm. This is a fundamental pattern of our perception of reality. So here we are back at the mare. And here I found this wonderful image in a book of the mare, right? Again, the seeding device or plow, you know, opening a path for currency. And you can see that there. This is basically like two obelisks in front of a temple. They are creating this path or symbolically pointing out that the path in the center of the temple is the zero point of a powerful magnetic current. Like I said, they built the structures to be living, breathing entities, and they chose power spots on the earth that harnessed two currents one horizontal and one perpendicular. And the center right? line of these temples is right on that line. Exactly. And the two uh, obelisks here are representing the dual opposing uh, currency. So on the center path, you always find um, the seated figures. Like if you go to the Temple of Luxor, you see the seated figures toward the center of the temple because you're sitting in their power. And as you move out from center, we're no longer centered, right? They find them, you find that the statues are balancing themselves with their left foot forward. Mm. Uh, the left foot being the, the uh, feminine side of the body. You need that to balance your feminine because we're in a uh, patriarchal separation consciousness. That's so amazing. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> they're, they're showing you how to make up for our handicap being in this new era of dampened exactly uh, human ability. <laughs> it's all about balance. Wow. So yeah, here's that prime meridian we were talking about. So the mayor becomes this, you know, this prefix to so many words. Uh, on the planet, and mare meant love, beloved. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. so incredible. So this thing, this current, this this symbol, this tool, you know, that, that is used for seeding and opening a path for currency is the mare. It's where we get the word Mary. Mary Magdalene, magnetic well, there line. Is. There she yeah. is. Oh, there she is, of course. And, you know, <laughs> holding the alabaster jar, but it, it, in a way, you know, it, it, it's the holy grail. Um, it's 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 so important. So yeah, uh, you can see there there is the mare being used. You know, the cows are pulling the mare right to open the path for the currency. Um, and you know, I have this Mary Magda line. It's a magnetic current, right? Mm -hmm. So the path of the Magdalene. I'm going to do a whole presentation on this. 
because this path of the Magdalene, you know, it goes north and it goes to Scotland. And there's also a story about the daughter of Akhenaten. Her name was Meritaten, right? Sco Scotia. Well, she becomes Scotia when she gets to Scotland. Mm. And they say, the legend has it, that they named Scotland after her. Um, so, but they go the same path. You know, it's, it's the same path north. So again, I'm, I'm going to do a whole presentation on it, but this is powerful knowing. And I'm not saying that Mary Magdalene didn't live. I'm saying that they take these major, that it's quite possible they take, you know, that the, the, the stories we have of people that actually lived and they, they you know, in, they, they put the formula on top of the story mm -hmm. and they implement the symbolism because the, the story is, is telling the story uh, in the same pattern, in the same knowing. Um, but yeah, the, the path of the Magdalene, the path of Mary Magdalene, the path of Maritotten, they're going north and they're taking the currency with them. Um, and of course we have these powerful meridians within us. So uh, everything we talk about that's happening outside is just you know an illusion for what's happening within, which is also an illusion, <laughs> but yeah. Um, we are bioelectric beings. We have we are electromagnetic, um, and when we speak about this currency, uh, it's it's vital knowing to understand how you know how we maintain health and balance. Mm -hmm. um, and we are going to talk about the different structures here. A place called the uh, Healing Hospital, Sound Healing Frequency Healing Hospital. They understood these basics, and they understood how to bring us back into basins, base back back into health, back into balance, back into maat by utilizing frequency resonance. Um, and this is really fascinating because when we look down from the top of the sphere of the the earth, uh, this black line in the left hand picture is that magnetic equator. And it runs around, as I said, through Nazca and Angkor Wat, and you can see Giza. Um, and what's really fascinating to me is the center of this circle is a place where we have an installation called HARP. Oh, we'll God. Talk about that in a second. <laughs> this is hugely insignificant, folks. Um, Good Lord. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> really, yeah, what's happening here? You know, this is the matrix of our, you know, our energetic magnetic matrix. You know, it's it's, it's matrix of our matrix. But you understand what I'm saying. This is so important. And what's really interesting is Jim Allison also noticed that the angle of the pyramid at the base is 51.5 degrees which is also the angle if you draw a line from the center of the circle uh, and draw it to uh, draw a line to Giza and Angkor Wat it makes this 51.5 degree angle not sure if that's significant or not but it seemed interesting enough to me to to to, to show everyone mm. so this is powerful stuff so what is harp um, this book, I met um, Dr. Nick Begich at a conference in, uh, in Phoenix, uh, and he wrote the book, Angels Don't Play This Harp. <laughs> it's an installation in Alaska. Um, uh, he was the eldest son of a uh, uh, late U.S. congressman from Alaska, and this, uh, he, he got involved in studying all this because his father was in a plane that went down in that magnetic anomaly I told you about in Alaska. I've seen programs here where they um, show how when you go in a flight through these areas, especially like if there's an electric storm or something, but mm -hmm. even when there's not, you go through these certain uh, areas over Alaska and the mag the, um, um, the magnetic odometer, whatever it is, starts spinning like crazy. <laughs> Um, so you can't even tell where you are. So really fascinating. But his father uh, went down in a plane, which they attribute to this kind of, uh, you know, something happened and they lost control of the plane. It sounds a but bit like the said, Bermuda Triangle. 
Very similar. Um, and, you know, I saw another program where they, this was really interesting. They spoke, they studied all of this. They, I think they even interviewed uh, Nick, um, but uh, who is an absolutely fascinating man, man, by the way. He's incredible. And the book's, book's great. Uh, I loved hearing him speak. Um, but when they went through everything and they showed so many beautiful things, I can't remember the name of the program, I'm sorry, but they did an experiment. They, they had, a, uh, uh, they created a tool that, or, or had a tool that could create a magnetic field, right? And I might've told you about this, Alan, but they placed it between two people. Um, and it was interesting because you could see it, even though it was a cameraman, obviously, showing us what was going on. So we were through, watching it through the lens of the camera, but the woman was very petite and small and thin, and the man was kind of chunky, a little heavier and much taller. And as they put this magnetic field, this vortex spin, basically it was a vortex gener generator between them, the man got smaller and the woman got larger. <laughs> she mm -hmm. got taller. And it was fascinating because it shows you that these these force fields, these magnetic fields, these zero point fields, if you will, can change our perception of time and space. And it that we're a, able to manipulate them. Exactly. So th this is this is where I'm getting at with this. This is powerful knowing. Which is um, what HARP does. HARP bounces radio uh, signals off of the ionosphere, like a, a like a targeted. Yep. There you have it. That's exactly what it does. Um, it's a joint project by the U.S. Navy, Air Force, and Alaska to create a very large radio frequency transmitter, which can transmit an electromagnetic beam into the upper atmosphere or ionosphere. This radio frequency energy is broadcast through a field of 48 antennas. And you saw them in the last uh, slide, which are 72 feet tall, and they have a cross dipole. They have a cross dive pulled across the top, if that makes sense. Electromagnetic waves then bounce back onto the earth uh, and penetrate everything, living and dead. Normally, radio frequency energy dissipates with distance, but by firing them in a unique way, the energy is focused and a cyclotron resonance effect occurs. This produces very much more concentrated and potent energy when it delivers its load either through magnetic lines of force or to the ionosphere. The cyclotron resonance energy wraps itself around these magnetic lines and it moves north to south. Now, this is just describing the energy, you know, the energetics of the process, but what they're capable of doing to create, to change our feeling our, as human beings on Earth, this can change our attitudes, this can change our emotions. Um, like they can create a shock and awe effect, if you will. Um, so th there's a lot behind this technology that is something that needs to be studied. <laughs> or, um, you know, it, it can it can have a... a we're going to talk about this more later, uh, maybe a, not a lot more. But it's, you know, if we have these instruments, I think as the, as the public, we need to know more about what's happening and how it can affect us. Mm -hmm. as uh, bioenergetic beings on the planet. All right, we have to remember whatever happens to the planet is essentially happening to us. Happening to us. We are in definite resonance with the planet, um, and that's what human resonance is all about. Um, so the Sphinx has also been called, uh, uh, especially today, Horam Akhet, uh, and Horam Akhet actually means the alignment, if you really understand it. The... Um, the image on the right side is actually the, the whore in the Akhet. The, okay, it's, it's the name or a market, exactly. Or M Akhet. Or M Akhet. So there you have it, um, and it's basically the whore, In my opinion, it's speaking to this magnetic current. Mm. Hor M Akhet. It's the alignment, um, and it's uh, it's Septepi. It's first breath. It's the line of fertility on the Giza Plateau. Um, and the image on the right, I just love because uh, you see this golden Horus figure. He probably at one time was wearing the double crown, and he's on the birthing box um, with this 
figure that is offering the two waters from heaven, the moon jars, right? This is this is beautiful. Uh, the two currents, it, yep, they come together uh, at this line where Upper and Lower Egypt uh, come together hmm. and then come apart. So yeah, yeah, really interesting. Um, Stella Wilden was a, is a beautiful woman I met in um, Australia who we talked about great length. She was a knowledge holder. She is a knowledge holder there. Um, and we had talked about this uh, uh, magnetic equator, and this is her image. And I, I like to use it because it shows how it's a sine wave pattern around the Earth. Uh, of course, nothing on a sphere is going to go in a linear <laughs> pattern, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it speaks to a time when Egypt was lush and green, when Tefnut was in Egypt at this powerful current, and it was. All right. Amazing. Well, we know from geology, ten thousand years ago, Egypt was essentially a savanna. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 Absolutely. This is what I'm talking about. It, you know, it was an annual pattern when you know the annual flooding of the Nile from you know the waters from Ethiopia. But it's also a, a much greater cyclical pattern of the great year, the the, the, the twelve thousand give or take, you know, uh, cycle of the um, path of the sun on the ecliptic, or well, the um, the great year. So again, you know, this 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 we were speaking about this harnessing the currency. And we do that in so many different ways. The uh, image in the bottom right-hand corner is from Fayum, and they have these wonderful, um, uh, uh, what do they call them, water wheels. Uh, these are ancient, hundreds of years old, and I'm sure built after patterns from something even more ancient. But they're harnessing the currency of the water that's flowing in the area and you see them all over Fayum. it's just beautiful and uh you can harness you know energetic currency as well um and so yeah this is what we've been talking about so okay i think we'll stop here and then uh, we'll get started with part two uh in the next presentation fantastic do you want to mention your tours um, well, we've been mentioning them. They're here. We'd love to have you. Um, I'd love to show you everything that we're talking about, uh, point it out, and uh, explain it on site. Um, and uh, we work with some really fantastic people, Brian Forrester, Jocelyn Mercado, Jocelyn Starfeather, who we've had on the program, and uh, she will be back again, I'm sure. Um, and we're going to be presenting some things together, Jocelyn and I, in the near future. So. Yeah, we, we love to bring interesting speakers, and we have so much to show and tell. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, check out our website, HorusRising.com. We will be back very soon with another episode of Metaphysical Egypt. Thanks, Patricia. Thank you, Alan. See you soon. See you soon. Everybody, please like, share, and subscribe. Thanks. Bye.